J5 lover, your number one Michael Jackson and Jackson 5 fan, and today I ask, did you know? This is where I talk about lesser known and rare facts about the Jackson 5, Michael Jackson, and the Jackson family. This video will be my third video in a series. I have two previous videos, which will be listed down below in the link box if you haven't seen those yet. But before we get started with five lesser known facts about the Jackson family, let's talk about this day in Jackson's history. Well, this day in Jackson's history, July 9th, 1981, the Jackson start their Triumph Tour. It's a world tour which starts in Memphis, Tennessee and ends in Los Angeles, California. And in between that time, of course, there are so many things that happen. Michael collapses on stage, actually, just from mere exhaustion, as we know, he overworked himself a lot. And he actually is unable to do concerts in Alabama and Florida that year. Um, but also what's so interesting about this tour is Rolling Stone magazine would later cite it as one of the best concert tours of the 1970s and 80s. And I could actually see that because this was just such a hot time in the Jackson's career and history. I bet it was a tour. It was a concert of a lifetime. Let's get into it. Five lesser known facts about the Jackson family or the Jackson Five Michael that you did not know. Fact number one, did you know that Latoya Jackson actually had a leather line? Yes, in 1984, Latoya signed a three-year contract with designer David Lorenz for her own leather line. She agreed to appear on television and in just public appearances wearing the different outfits. I really actually love some of these outfits, as you can see here. Like, a lot of the jackets and stuff really emulated Michael's kind of look at the time, which I'm sure that's what she was going for. There's some similarities with like the beat it jacket and the thriller jacket and um, the Billie Jean jacket. And um, also she had leather headbands, which was interesting because apparently she liked wearing headbands a lot around the house. Michael suggested that she should wear these headbands out in public and that could be like a part of her look and it would start a trend, which it actually did. And uh, you can see LaToya throughout the 1980s and even sometimes later on in her career wearing various headbands, most of which she put together and made herself. And her leather line actually uh, did fairly well. They sold in a lot of the merry-go-round stores. And um, the technical name of her line was called uh, David Lorenz for LaToya. And of course, as you know, the rest is history. Did you know? Number two, the Jacksons had a lot of uh, various places that they lived before they settled in their Havenhurst home in 1971. The Jacksons actually moved out to California in 1969 um, with, you know, Motown and Barry Gordy had set them up in various hotels and rented homes. And of course, they had to be out there to do some recording for their first album. And the Jacksons even laid their head down occasionally in Barry Gordy's house. And occasionally Michael even stayed with Diana Ross. The first rented house that the Jacksons were set up in was on 1601 Queens Road. They stayed there from October of 1969 to May of 1970 before they moved to 2430 Beaumont Drive. Um, and 2430 Beaumont Drive is so interesting because you can actually see photographs of them um, like on the cover of Ebony Magazine and different things like that sitting on the stoop. There were quite a few pictures taken there of the Jacksons before they finally settled at 4641 Havenhurst in May of 1971. Um, what was so interesting though, before they moved to Havenhurst as well, was the fact that a lot of the neighbors didn't like the noise that they made because they were always rehearsing and practicing and uh, there were some complaints and they were in the valley. So it was so much easier once they got to Havenhurst because there was a built-in studio. And what was so great about Havenhurst is that it was previously owned by music and television composers 
composer Earl Hagen. Um, he's best known for composing the music to The Andy Griffiths Show, as well as The Mod Squad and That Girl. What was so great about Havenhurst, it was a five bedroom, seven bathroom home. They had lemon trees, tangerine trees, orange trees, a built-in pool, a basketball court, and a tennis court. And at 10,476 square feet, $250,000 was the perfect amount of money for this beautiful, perfect space for the Jackson family. Of course, a home like that today would be worth millions. Did you know, number three, who Ronnie Ransifer and Johnny Jackson are? Well, they are members of the Jackson Five. Actually, they were more like musicians of the Jackson Five group band. Um, they both joined in the mid 60s and both were um, gone by 1975 at the end of the Jackson's contract with Motown. So Johnny Jackson was actually a student in Gary, Indiana at Beckman High, and he joined the Jacksons in 1967, and he played the drums. And of course you could see him in old pictures of the Jackson Five at Steeltown and certain television appearances as well. Now, Ronnie Ransifer was the keyboardist for the Jackson 5, and he actually was one of the writers for their infamous song, I Am Love. By the 1980s, however, Ronnie Ransifer um, helped other Motown group singers and acts like Smokey Robinson. What was so interesting about Johnny and Ronnie was the fact that not only did they join the Jackson 5 band in Gary, Indiana, but they actually moved to L.A. with the group in 1969 and lived with the family for several years. Of course, the boys went their separate ways from the Jackson family as they went to college and got caught up in the Hollywood scene in the 70s. But um, they were definitely such a big part of the Jackson 5's family and life for such a long time. They both had their own uh, bunking room at the Jackson home in Havenhurst. I feel like both Johnny and Ronnie are so forgotten and uncredited and, you know, because they're kind of in the background, but they were a part of the Jackson 5 band until 1975 when they left Motown. Now, of course, back in the 70s, it was rumored that both of them were cousins of the Jacksons, but of course, that was just a rumor. Neither one had any relation to the Jackson family. Unfortunately, Johnny Jackson passed away in 2006 as he was stabbed to death by his girlfriend at the time. And uh, may he rest in peace. Did you know, number four, that Tito Jackson and Johnny Jackson were arrested for stealing? Yes, on April 12th, 1973, apparently the boys had broken into a shop and taken television and stereo sets. They had to go to court on October 3rd, 1973 to testify for this robbery. Um, and what's so interesting about this is the fact that there's very little actually known about this. There's only this one photograph actually that I've ever seen of them appearing in court. I think that actually the situation was squashed pretty quickly and I would assume that it was probably just a young boy prank, obviously because they could afford what they took and that the items were quickly returned and the situation was squashed and that everything was settled pretty quietly in court. It's so funny because even when I was looking up um, various newspaper articles and magazine articles back then, all I could really find was um, an October issue of, in 1973 of Right On Magazine, just a fan asking, was it true that they had stolen some items? And Right On just said, yes, they have stolen these. They did steal. But there was no further um, conversation about it. Um, and even my father, ironically, remembers at the time hearing something briefly on the radio about it. But once again, I think the incident was quickly squashed. They didn't want it to be have high publicity. And um, like I said, I, I, I would just assume it was a young boy prank kind of thing and that the items were quickly returned. Did you know, number five, that Michael Jackson actually wrote a manifesto back in 1979? Yes, on the back of his 1979 Destiny Tour itinerary, Michael Jackson wrote a manifesto of what he wanted to be in the future and where he saw his career headed. Let me read this to you. MJ will be my new name. 
No more Michael Jackson. I want a whole new character, a whole new look. I should be a totally different person. People should never think of me as the kid who sang ABC or I Want You Back. I should be a new, incredible actor, singer, and dancer that will shock the world. I will do no interviews. I will be magic. I will be a perfectionist, a researcher, a trainer, a masterer. I will be better than every actor roped into one. I find that manifesto so chilling just because everything that Michael wrote basically became true and and even more he became known as the greatest entertainer of all times and even to this day even though it's been now 13 years that Michael has passed away he's still known as the greatest entertainer of all time probably the only thing in that statement that was not totally true um was that he granted interviews still, but as time went on, he granted fewer and fewer interviews. Michael rarely did interviews as his career wore on, but everything else in that was to a T. I mean, most people who didn't grow up listening to the Jackson 5 don't even connect Michael Jackson with the Jackson 5 anymore, just like he wrote. And most people know him as MJ. But like I said before, We'll always know him as the greatest entertainer that ever was in our generation. Okay, so that concludes this episode of Did You Know? Uh, please tell me down in the comments uh, if there were some things that I told you that you didn't know. Make sure to check the description box below for part one and part two of Did You Know? as well. Also, you can follow me on Instagram when I'm not here on YouTube. Thank you guys so much for watching today, and I'll see you next time. Bye.